It's his motto to become the U.S. printer. Uh, campaign that he had to essentially scan all of the federal documents and put them online. Uh, Carl is the person that I turned to when I was working at the state senate to ask them, uh, to ask the world, uh, the state senate has all of this content, please tell us about copyright uh, that it essentially affects every single municipality and government that's outside of the federal government. And Carl's been liberating data and information uh, long, when, uh, long before we came out of uh, our cradles and cribs. Um, and so it's a great honor to have Carl here. Uh, he's got a fun evening uh, for us. It's not boring, I guarantee you that. Uh, and so thanks, Carl. Take it away. Thank you, Noel. Thank you, Lauren, for inviting me. <laughs> Who has used PACER? Have any of you actually logged in and used PACER? I'm going to do a brief overview of what PACER is because those of you that have not used it are not going to believe what I'm about to say. Uh, so PACER is the system for filing and retrieving the materials for our federal courts. It began with our U.S. District Courts and is now being used for the Court of Appeals. So it's how a lawyer files a brief or a motion or something of that sort and that's the filing side of it. The dissemination side, and PACER stands for Public Access to Court <coughs> Electronic Records, is a bunch of code that looks like it was Perl code in 1994 and it was a bit outdated at the time. So they charge for access to PACER. Now you may think that our courts have to function in the light of day. That goes all the way back to Magna Carta when they had star chambers, right, people would like have, have court, courts in back rooms and they would decide things and they would just make up the law on the fly. And the whole point of Magna <laughs> Carta was that all of a sudden this thing had to be in public. Despite that, our courts charge 10 cents per page to access PACER. And you have to have a valid credit card. There are some opinions that are online and available, but not all of them. They have to be designated as a public opinion by the judge. Um, and this system is, like I said, got a UI that if you haven't seen it, you're just not going to believe it. I mean, it really looks like Netscape, you know, 2.0. Um, there's no blinkies. Uh, some of the court sites have blinkies, though, uh, believe it or not. Um, there is really no search capability. You can search by the name of the case. Um, there's a little bit of search in the sense of give me copyright cases. But even when you do that, you're paying 10 cents a page. Right? So if you do a big search, it's going to cost you a whole bunch of money. No metadata to speak of, very little. There are dockets, uh, but the dockets are really bad HTML that's not valid. So you can parse it, but not easily. Right? You can't bring in all the dockets and say, give me all the, all the case names without <laughs> doing a lot of munging. Now, you may ask why they charge for this. And the official reason is Congress said you have to charge for this. Now, Congress didn't say you have to charge everybody for this. They simply said you have to recoup your costs. Um, so what the courts have done is it's pretty much 10 cents a page. There is a provision that if you use 15 bucks or less in a quarter, they don't bill you. You still have to have a credit card, right? You still have to register. Um, but in theory, if you do 15 bucks um, a quarter or less, you're not charged. Now, 15 bucks is not a lot of 10 cents a page. There's a maximum of three bucks per document. So think about that five long briefs in a court case, you've reached your 15 bucks. I have court cases that have 150 documents in them. So you can't do a lot on that 15 bucks a quarter. Now, in 2008, the courts decided they would have an experiment to see whether or not the public might or might not be interested in access to PACER, because their general point of view is that only lawyers need this stuff. Right? Maybe people want the opinions, but you know, what's your problem? You just, you know, if you're a lawyer, you need it. If you're not, you don't. And so they, they set up a public access mechanism in 20 libraries across the country. Now, that, that's one public access point for every 20,000 square miles, um, which is not necessarily the most generous you could be. And in 2008, I put a, a website up which had frequently asked questions about PACER. And I went through all their finances, and why Congress said to charge. And in there, I put something about the thumb drive core. I said, look, everybody go to you know, the libraries and download a few documents and upload them to my site. And that was really symbolic. I didn't expect to get a lot of documents that way, because it's a pain in the neck. 
Um, but a couple people, one named Steve Schultz and one named Aaron Swartz, decided they would take me up on that offer. And so they called me up and said, well, we want to get some documents. I said, well, cool. And then I got a call from Aaron a little later, and he said, well, I got some documents. Can I have a login on your server? He said, yeah, we don't usually do that. Uh, gave him a login. And I got a call from my sysadmin saying, well, you know, we have 168 gigabytes of data now on the system that Aaron has uploaded. I said, well, he's a bright boy. Um, so <laughs> and then all of a sudden we got a call saying public access to these libraries has been terminated. The public uh, printer of the United States says they've been hacked. The FBI has been called. And we were like, oh my god. Um, so I very carefully looked at it. There were no terms of use. You, when you went into a library, you know, it didn't say only download one or two documents. And as I told the FBI when they interviewed me about this, granted we surprised the bureaucrats, but it's not a crime to surprise a bureaucrat. 20 million pages, maybe they weren't expecting it. But it's what we did. Now, I had previously put the Court of Appeals online, the opinions of the Court of Appeals. And the minute I put them online, this is something Larry Lessing and I did, we spent $600,000 to buy the back file from a vendor. And we put them online, and this was the first time these things were on the internet, and about three days later I started getting calls and emails saying, you have my social security number on the internet. I was like, really? And so we looked, and sure enough, a lot of Court of Appeals decisions had social security numbers in them. It, maybe it was an appeal of a benefits case with the Social Security Administration, and Social Security Administration used your social security number as a docket number. That got appealed. But there were also a whole bunch of just in the opinions. There were socials. And so I did an audit. I removed all the socials I had on my system, sent a formal audit to the head of the, the uh, Judicial Conference Rules Committee, uh, Judge Rosenthal, and the circuits went ahead and removed the ones that were on their court sites. Because in my audit, I, I specified exactly uh, which, which of the documents I had found socials in were also still live on the Court of Appeals website. So when we had this FBI issue, um, I began an intensive audit of these 20 million pages. Got, found a whole boatload of social security numbers, names of minor children that had AIDS, you're not supposed to publish names of minor children, names of confidential informants, improperly unsealed documents. And so I sent in a preliminary audit to Judge Rosenthal again, um, and then finished the audit up and sent it on in to, uh, to Judge Rosenthal, a, a pretty comprehensive audit. It was a, a series of spreadsheets that said, this case number, this document number, these are the socials we found. And then I began sending out these letters to the chief judges of the 32 district courts. And they all ignored me. And so I sent a second letter out to the chief judges of 32 district courts. And they ignored me again. And so I sent letters out that said third and final notice in big red letters on the top. Now, you got to gulp before you do that. Because you know, chief judge of a US district court is a fairly powerful position. Um, I started getting some letters back. Judge Lamberth of the DC district said, you know what? You're right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. New York Times wrote this up. Uh, there was a letter from Senator Lieberman to the Judicial Conference saying, hey, what's up with, first of all, this silly paywall, but what's up with these social security numbers? And they sent a letter back, Judge Rosenthal and Mr. Duff, who ran the administrative office of the courts, saying, well, we charge because Congress said to charge, and this is good. And for privacy, we're taking this very seriously. Thank you so much for all this empirical evidence. We're on it. Remember that. That's going to be relevant. So I began focusing on real work then, because I, I had been doing seminars all across the country about law.gov, the idea that all the primary legal materials of the United States should be available without restriction. We got lots of law libraries, and you know, deans of law schools were participating. Uh, we had Larry Tribe, the constitutional law professor, speak. Um, it was nice, but it didn't really get much done. Right? We had our principles, we had a rapport, we had video, but it didn't actually change anything. So I began focusing in on real work, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But I started working on edicts of government, on, on things that are required by law, like building codes, that may have a copyright assertion on them, but they are nevertheless the law, things like the National Electrical Code. Um, Aaron went on and did some stuff with JSTOR. And between the edicts of government and his JSTOR stuff, I realized that the stakes had really gone up dramatically. 
um, Aaron was totally persecuted. Um, I don't think he was going to publish that data, right? Because, you know, the previous time Aaron had done a big download, it had been from the Westlaw database. And you know what he did with that data? He didn't put it on BitTorrent. He analyzed it for professors that had gotten corporate contributions and had written an article that was then used by the contributor in their court cases. So he was able to show corruption in the legal profession. And my guess was that's what, what he was probably going to do with JSTAR. We will never know. He didn't tell me. Um, but it was very clear that the stakes were pretty high. Um, so meanwhile, PACER, which I had ignored, um, they cut off all meaningful public access. Right? All these libraries were gone. And they raised their prices 25%. It was 8 cents a page. Now it's 10 cents a page. And I was pretty frustrated. Now, last summer, there was a weird thing that happened. The, the administrative office of the courts, which runs PACER, announced they were deleting PACER documents from five courts, four courts of appeals and a bankruptcy court. And everyone went nuts. I started getting calls from law librarians going, oh my god, they're deleting data. Um, so there were letters from you know, six members of Congress to the court saying, what are you doing? There were letters from four senators. Senator Leahy went storming into the judicial conference going, oh my god. We got snookered because it turns out they didn't have the data in the first place. All they had were these docket sheets that listed the previous cases. I probably should have figured that out because I was pretty familiar. But we were all like totally outraged and organized letters. And at the end of the day, there was really nothing. Uh, but it really showed the lack of communication, because I wasn't the only one fooled. Senator Leahy's staff called them up and said, oh my god, what are you doing? I said, well, it's technically incompatible with the next-gen PACER system. And, we're looking, and when we found out, it was just a single file. It was a text file, right? <laughs> technically incompatible. I mean, oh, come on. This can't be that hard. Um, so I began working on a memo about PACER. Just because I really, I just felt that it was time to do something else. And as I was working on that memo, um, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court every year issues an annual report. It used to be they'd type it out on a typewriter. It's usually 10 pages, very eloquent. Things like judicial salaries or the future of justice. This year was about PACER. And, the chief, and I think maybe it was a reaction to Senator Leahy yelling at the Chief Justice in the Judicial Conference. We'll never know why he decided to do that. But this, this thing, this report that he did, talked about PACER. Over a billion documents available, and for a modest fee, anyone can access this wonderful system. He talked about how the judiciary has to be a little bit slower than the other branches. And then he said, they're going to put everything from the Supreme Court online. I said, well, that's great. You know, all the briefs, all the motions. But they're not going to use PACER. They're going to write their own system. <laughs> OK, <laughs> rousing defense. So the question is, how do you do something about PACER? How, how do you solve this problem? Because you know, if you go to the administrative office, their reaction is, what's your problem? Lawyers need this. They got plenty of money. Normal people don't need this. You know, Why, why, why do you care about this issue? And you know, you could talk about justice and transparency, and they still just roll their eyes. Now, you go talk to a federal judge, that's a different story. Because they're more like, well, I don't use PACER. What's your problem, Carl? And you explain it. And they're like, oh, I get it. For example, I can't audit a district court for social security numbers because I don't have the million dollars it would take to download everything. Um, if you're a big data person and you want to analyze civil rights litigation in different districts to see whether Missouri is more unfair than California, for example, you can't do that. If you want to analyze patent litigation to see whether maybe the Eastern District of Texas is like on the side of plaintiffs way more than they ought to be. Intuitively, we know that. But real numbers are nice. So how do you solve this? Well. I have seven ways, and I want to go over those. Uh, number one, judges don't get a lot of personal correspondence from citizens, right? And so idea number one is, what if we send postcards to a bunch of federal judges, say, dear your honor, I really care about PACER. I'm a law student. I'm a lawyer. I'm a baker. I watched you preside over the recent muffin trial. Whatever, just some personal thing, right, that, that says, hey, I really care about this. And my theory is that if a judge gets 30, 40, 50 postcards saying, I really care about PACER, maybe they'll call their clerk in and say, would you like figure out what their problem is? 
and maybe the judges will talk to each other and say, you know, I got a bunch of postcards. So I printed these postcards using Moo, and they're, they're pictures of famous judges like Learned Hand and Cardoza. There's Oliver Wendell Holmes. There's pictures of Louis Brandeis. And so I'm going to hand these out. These are not souvenirs. I want these back. And so if you have something to say about Pacer, that would go to a New York judge, and the, the one that you probably want to write to is Loretta Preska, P-R-E-S-K-A, but you don't have to remember her name. So what I have here are mailing labels, and I also have a bunch of fancy Pacer stamps that I printed, custom USPS postage that have like pictures of a telegraph op operator and the word Pacer, or an old lady with a huge docket book and the word Pacer or Justice Blindfolded Pacer. So the, the deal on these postcards is if you can fill out the left-hand side, right? don't fill out the right-hand side, because i got to put a label on a stamp on there, and then we're going to collect these back up. If you don't have anything to say, don't feel you have to do it. Um, and what I'll do is I'll take these, I'll bring them home, I'm going to scan them all and put them up on Flickr so we got a record of what's going on, and then I'll get them out um, for everybody else. So I'm going to let you guys hand these things out. There's two batches. Yes. Can I something Michigan judge? Uh, you could. Yeah, you'd have to address it yourself. Um, you can just, do you know the name of the Michigan judge? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I can, either you can like, you know, figure it out while you're doing it or, or we'll, we'll figure that out. But go ahead and write your, your message. Um, so, you know, the idea here is just write something, we'll collect them. So, on, I, and I'm doing this, I, I was up in Boston, I did it at Harvard, I did it at MIT, I'm going to go do the DC legal hackers next week. Um, and then on May 1, which is known as Law Day, you guys know the origin of Law Day? You're going to love this. So in, in the 1950s, those communists were like a real problem in the United States. And so McCarthy and his buddies um, decided they would relabel May 1 and call it Law Day, right? Which is what good Americans celebrated instead of this godless, you know, May Day pagan ritual that the communists were doing. Um, so the American Bar Association has totally embraced Law Day, and this year they're doing the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, and there'll be speeches and symposiums, and I thought we would kind of crash their thing. So on May Day, I'm going to open up a Pacer polling place at the Internet Archive, set up a bunch of tables, polling booth, uh, Brewster Kale's going to have a scanner there, um, and you know, the idea is vote for justice, vote early, vote often. Um, we're going to try to get a whole bunch of postcards. Dan O'Neill, who does Smart Chicago, is going to do that in Chicago. Um, so I'm kind of testing the concept out on, on this speaking tour to see whether people are actually willing to, to do this. So item one, hearts and minds, cards and letters, right? That's one way to maybe convince judges that this is something important that they should be doing. So while you're filling those out or looking at the cards, <coughs> I'm going to talk about the six other ways we can do this. And pardon me, I have a bit of a sore throat. So. So, what about just suing the courts, right? Pay, sir, 10 cents a page, unconstitutional. It turns out that's really hard to do. Um, there is no constitutional right to a free lunch. Congress said you got to charge for pay, sir, right? Um, it is possible that this goes up to the level of a constitutional crime, right? Equal protection, due process being violated, but that's pretty hard. Um, it's hard to sue over a PACER fee exemption. You can petition a judge and ask for a free PACER, but it's at the judge's discretion. And so we looked at ways to sue. I haven't figured out one, although we have the possibility of a couple others. So, um, cards and letters, suing the courts. Um, Congress said to charge, right? Congress said you got to charge. Now, they didn't say you got to charge everyone. Congress said you, you, you got to charge. What if Congress said you may not charge? End of discussion. Um, and there is actually Congressman Honda introduced in the Appropriations Committee, which has oversight, a provision that says, and the court shall remove all PACER fees and instead raise the filing fees. If you're litigating in federal court, it costs you 400 bucks to file a complaint, right? You're some big corporate copyright. It wouldn't be hard to raise those fees just a little bit and drop the paywall for dissemination. And so what this writer on the appropriations bill says, the court should either do that or submit a report to the Congress explaining the different business models they've, they've, they've looked at and why or why not they may not want to do them. Um, but at least at the very least, they're going to have to do a, um, <clears throat> a report. 
billing errors. So it's 10 cents a page, which is for a PDF file, pretty easy to do, right? You know the number of pages. But when you get your dockets or you do a search, you're getting bad HTML back. And the courts, if you look at their rule manual, it says that's about 4,000 bytes equals one page. And I started looking, I've got dockets that have a long list of lawyers on them. And I was looking at these 60 cent charges for a docket and I'm thinking to myself, this doesn't seem right because there was nothing in the docket except the names of the lawyers. And so I measured the number of bytes. And it turned out they were charging me 60 cents for something according to their rule manual ought to be 20 cents. So I sent in a fee refund to the Pacer Service Center, a refund request for 40 cents. <laughs> Took about a month. I got a note back from them saying, well, we can't actually process a refund till, uh, until we've actually billed this. We don't bill to the end of the quarter, at which point we will be doing your refund. And I couldn't tell whether that meant they were actually giving me my 40 cents or they were going to think about giving me the 40 cents. And so I sent a, a letter to Mr. Lowney, who was the division director of the administrative office, saying, you know, I think you got a systematic billing error problem here. Every single docket with a lot of lawyers, you're overcharging by a significant amount. I think this is millions of dollars. Well, maybe class action, although again, it may or may not be a class action, but I did cite a um, uh, Contracts 101 um, case, which you know is one of those, if you post an advertisement, you have to charge that price, and if you charge them a different price, then people can sue you. And I'm sure the lawyers at the administrative office were just rolling their eyes on that one, but you know. Um, and I also CC Congressman Issa, who runs the IP and the Court Subcommittee of the House Judiciary, um, sent it over to the Congress as well. Next, the privacy scandal. So remember I told you about that 2008 audit I did with the names of the cases and the document number and all the social securities? As I was researching my memo, um, I went to the US court's website and I noticed they had posted an unredacted version of my audit on uscourts.gov. I was aghast because they had discussed my audit in, they commissioned a report to see whether or not my audit was valid, they discussed it in the appellate review committee, they discussed it in the civil rules committee, um, and some judges had removed, you know, those things. But what I found is not only did they post the unredacted version of my audit, just on a hunch, I said, you know, I got letters back from some judges, but not from all of them. So I pulled up Northern District of Illinois. Sure enough, very first document, 10-3, pulled it up in the live pacer, five pages of social security numbers with, you know, home addresses and financial information. They had not removed the documents. And so I sent a letter to Judge Rosenthal and Mr. Lowney. I didn't say you lied to the United States Senate. But you know, the Senate sent them a letter and they sent a letter back saying we're on top of this. And they had simply ignored it. Um, the United States Senate does not like it when people mislead them. And so I have briefed a variety of staff members and we'll see whether or not anything happens. Two more things that you might be able to do. I had thought the sweet spot was using that $15 per quarter loophole. And in my memorandum, which by the way is at yo.yourhonor.org, um, in that memorandum I said, gee, what if everybody across the country downloads their 15 bucks on May Day and you know, the law school that has the most downloads gets the sports cup? And I didn't get a peep from law students. They just didn't organize because they all use Bloomberg. They didn't care. Um, there may be some downloads, but frankly, I just don't think there's going to be a lot of you know, people downloading on May Day. Um, but, you know, it was a good idea, and it may still happen. Um, but I just don't think there's going to be a ton of folks all going out and doing that. It's hard to get a lot of crowdsourcing on these kinds of things. You know, getting 100 postcards is maybe possible. Getting 10,000 law students to all do 15 bucks a quarter is going to be much harder. Even 10,000 citizens. I mean, you've got to register, you've got a credit card, you've got to care enough. Um, so I don't know if that's going to work. So I have repositioned the Swartz Cup, which is this beautiful green marble thing that looks like the Internet Archive logo, and it says Swartz Law Day 2015. And I've changed the rules, and since it's an Aaron Swartz Cup, I'm allowed to change the rules because he would have changed the rules. Um, <laughs> so that would have been fine. So I'm going to give it out for other things. And like Brewster Kale is probably going to get one of these things for having done a Pacer polling place. 
you know, I just haven't gotten a mass outpouring of any, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different folks, journalism students, citizens, lawyers that might have done it. Why and not, Why not Kickstarter? I mean, like, why not just put it out there? You know, so I've done Kickstarters, and I've, I, again, I've just never, I mean, I did a Kickstarter for uh, re-keying edicts of government. I'm specifically talking about getting the downloads going, getting yeah. some, I'm just telling you my experience, no, which I is I, I've just, uh, I just haven't had a lot. There is one more thing you can do. So uh, with PACER, you can ask for a fee exemption from a judge. That's usually a prisoner researching his own cases. Um, there are some guidelines as to who gets a fee exemption and who doesn't. <coughs> um, one of the provisions normally with a fee exemption is you're not allowed to redistribute the data. So I'm working with a really good lawyer, Tom Burke from Davis Wright Tremaine. And we filed in the Ninth Circuit of the Court of Appeals a formal request for a fee exemption. And what we asked for was an entire district. We actually didn't ask for an entire district. We asked for four entire districts and the Ninth Circuit. And we said, if you give us all this data, two things are going to happen. Number one, I will analyze that district for privacy violations. And I will report back to the court whether or not your privacy rules are working or not. This is a service to the court. But we're going to also upload all that data to the Internet Archive. And we have affidavits from Brewster Kale and Brian Carver from the Free Law Project, but also from distinguished researchers that do big data analysis of legal corpuses. We have a law librarian from Oregon uh, a Law School. We have another law librarian from a public library. Um, so this is a big deal formal request to Chief Judge Thomas of the Ninth Circuit. Um, they may or may not grant us this request. Um, chances are they won't. Uh, but we argue that they have the authority to give us that, that data. And most importantly, they owe it to themselves to do one experiment. It's a big country. They ought to, with one district, see whether or not making it more broadly available leads to all these beneficial uses that we say might be happening. And so those are the seven things that I've kind of thrown out there as possible things to do for PACER. Um, you know, these big databases usually take a decade. It took me 10 years to get the patent database actually online. I mean, I put it online three times, and I always thought they were taking it over, and they weren't. Um, it, it takes a long time to do these things. So we started PACER in 2008. I would not be surprised if we're doing this in 2018. Um, this is part of a broader issue, which I call edicts of government. Edicts of government are the laws. They are court opinions, that's the law. They are statutes, they are regulations. Edicts of government go from the lowest level, the municipal water board, all the way up to our federal government. The US Copyright Office, in their compendium of office practice procedures, says in the United States, edicts of government have no copyright as a matter of public policy. There's a series of court cases going back to Wheaton v. Peters in 1824 that says the law has no copyright in the United States of America because the people own the law. It's ours. It isn't the judges, right? That opinion, he's been paid already for that opinion. The legislator has been paid for the statute. We own the law. Despite that, however, you would be shocked. The state of Delaware corporate code has a provision, section 397, that says if you copy the Delaware corporate code without permission, three months in jail. Uh, the state of Idaho says you need a license before you can copy even their statutes. And there's a Supreme Court opinion, Banks v. Manchester, statutes absolutely do not have copyright in the United States. They, they simply do not. I mean, unless, like, a new Supreme Court turns that over. But you know, this is an 1898 um, opinion. It's been on the books forever. Copyright Office uh, concurs with that. Um, the state of Mississippi and Georgia have purchased their official state code annotated, the official court code of Georgia annotated, the Mississippi Code 1972. I spent a couple thousand dollars, bought the big stack of books, scanned them all, put them online. Nasty takedown letter from the Mississippi Attorney General. Whole series of correspondence from the Georgia Senator who is in charge of the Judiciary Committee. Um, for a long time, municipalities asserted copyright over their municipal codes. That seems to have changed. The cities are actually a real bright light. 
and city codes are actually going online without restrictions due to a whole bunch of people. The DC hackers did a wonderful job on the DC code. A guy named Seamus Kraft did the Chicago code. Um, it really is beginning to, to blossom. But the states haven't gotten the memo. And more importantly, there are a series of documents required by law that are technical, building codes, which are made by nonprofits that make like the National Electrical Code or the ANSI standard for safe ladders. And those standards are incorporated by reference into the Code of Federal Regulations and into state law. So it isn't like the law is saying, oh, National Electrical Code. The National Electrical Code is the law. It is incorporated by reference. Despite that, these code people assert copyright over the documents. Um, so I have spent uh, a lot of money uh, buying these model codes, putting them online, um, including in many cases double keying. So I start with the paper documents, sent them to India, had them typed twice so you can compare the versions, reset them into HTML. We had school kids redraw the diagrams into SVG. We recoded the formulas into Math ML, have posted them online. I started that in 2008 with the Building Code of California, expanded to the rest of the country. 2012 began putting 1,000 standards in the Code of Federal Regulations. We have since expanded to about 1,000 safety codes required by the European Union and 19,000 standards that are required by the Bureau of Indian Standards in India. Also did quite a few others had about 28,000 codes online. And at first, nobody was paying attention. And then we got sued by three of the, the code organizations, including the National Fire Protection Association, claiming massive copyright infringement. And then a second suit came in in the US. So there's a total of six plaintiffs, two district court cases. I am represented by EFF by Fenwick and West, uh, one of the leading copyright litigators in the country, and by Dury Tangray, um, which is Mark Lemley and, and Joe Gratz. So I, I have a good legal team on my side. It is pitched litigation. We are finishing up discovery now on case one. We're going to be finishing up on case two. But there are 15 lawyers on the docket from their side. Um, it's been nasty. In Europe, we got sued for posting the European Union mandated safety standard for baby pacifiers by the German standards body. So what happens in Europe is the European Union mandates a directive or regulation. The uh, purportedly private standards body, known as CEN or CENELEC, Center for European Normalization, um, begins to work on a standard in baby pacifier or toys or hazmat transport. Um, they submit a work plan to the EU. It then gets approved by the government. They issue the standard. It is published in the official journal. Every standards body in Europe has six months to implement that standard as a national standard with no changes. Despite that, they claim that these are voluntary standards. And if you talk to the Europeans, or some of them, they say, well, you know, the law simply says don't kill babies. This standard, the baby pacifier one, was 160 bucks to buy, and it's officially copyrighted, so in theory you can't, you can't speak it. Um, this standard is one way to not kill babies. You can not kill babies any way you want. Therefore, this standard is voluntary. And I just don't buy that. Right? I just don't buy it because a homeowner or anyone else, a journalist, ought to be able to read these things. This is the minimum performance standard for baby pacifiers or hazmat or civil use of explosives. These are the most important laws for many people, right? Criminal law, most people don't deal with that. Electrical code, got to have an outlet no less than three feet apart no more than three feet apart. And you, you know the reason for that, they don't want extension cords like all over the floor. And so the electrical code, if, or the building code, if you want to build a deck on your home, it's the kind of thing you have to interact with. And so to me, those edicts of government are absolutely crucial, um, but it's a little broader than that. And I'm going to conclude on this point. Um, so you have primary legal materials emitted by a, a jurisdiction, right? The Supreme Court has opinions. But in order to read that opinion properly, you also want to see the briefs that were filed, right? So the secondary materials that were filed as part of the generation of the edicts of government is important. 
a congressional law. If you're going to sue over a congressional law, you're going to end up wondering about congressional intent. And so the hearings that led to that law are a crucial thing. And that's why I care about PACER. The opinions are important, but anyone ought to be able to read those secondary materials by that lawmaking body. And that is kind of the big picture of what we're trying to do here. You ought to have the right to read the law for free, but more importantly, you shouldn't need a license to speak the law. You ought to be able to get electrical codes from four different places without a license and compare them and say how they differ. Right? How are the building codes different in New York City and in New Jersey? Um, can buildings be built in different ways? If you're a contractor, you need to know that kind of stuff. And you know, there are criminal penalties for violating these laws. These, these are not discretionary. Um, and so that's the fight. And that's why PACER is important to me, and it's why edicts of government more generally is such an important area. So that's what I got. Happy to hear questions. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes? What do you see as the, the major uh, resistance to any of this? Is it just inertia? Is this the way we've done it in the past and we don't feel like changing it? We don't, we don't want to think about this? Or is there, do they really envision as, as some sort of revenue stream that they want to protect? The uh, question is what, what, why all the inertia uh, money? money. Uh, the courts get $150 million from PACER. Uh, it costs them about $11 million to actually run PACER. According to the E-Government Act, they shouldn't be making a profit, but they do. They're making a big profit, and they use it for good things like widescreen TVs in the courtrooms, which they should have. Uh, but to me, there's two issues. One is, should they be charging at all? And then if they are charging, they should like observe the law. It really is a money thing. A lot of states say that the reason that, that a company like Lexus um, has the official code of Georgia annotated done by Lexus is that if the state made the official code of Georgia annotated, it would cost them a bunch of money. Lexus is doing them a big favor by doing all the codification and the annotation. They should be able to recoup their cost. And so it really is a question of a revenue stream. Well, Lexus, I guess, is separate, but the, if the official version, you arguing for the Lexus version to be? No, you well, see well, here, in just, many states, the official just, version is the Lexus version. Many, many states. Uh, in Georgia, the official code of Georgia annotated says copyright state of Georgia published by Lexus. And you have to pay them Lexus money to get a copy of the official code of Georgia annotated, which I did, and scanned it and put it online, and hence the takedown notices. I'm hearing the questions, good. You are hearing the questions, good. Is this, is this something that can be foiled? I mean, because it's not necessarily an open information, can you FOIA it in some way? Nah, so FOIA is an interesting thing. So you can't FOIA the courts, right, for one. Um, you can FOIA the executive branch, and I actually have submitted a series of 20 FOIA requests for standards incorporated by reference. And I'm getting, so this is 10 different agencies, and I, I FOIA the Office of the Federal Register as well. They have a copy of these things in a reading room in Washington. And I've gotten some calls back from FOIA officers saying, again, what's your problem? We have a copy of this in Denver. Just go there with a roll of quarters and make a copy. <laughs> and my position is, no, it's a federal record. Um, FOIA doesn't work like that. You've got to send it to me. Now, they are going to deny these FOIA requests. Um, the question is, can we then appeal and potentially litigate? Um, so that's a possibility. The other thing we're doing is, is submitting a comment every time the government uh, says they're going to incorporate a standard by reference, a notice of proposed rulemaking, um, we submit a comment. So we, we just started this. Uh, we began by submitting a joint comment with Greenpeace over the hazmat transport of oil on railroad standard, and it requires a document that's like 800 bucks. Uh, we recently submitted one with the Center for Auto Safety, which is a Ralph Nader operation, right, unsafe at any speed. And we're, we're protesting a Federal Highway uh, Administration standard. Now, again, so we're submitting the comments saying they're not available. They must be available. They need to deal with that before issuing the final rule. And they may, what they typically say these days, because we've been doing this for a while, is they are available to people that matter. So the, the AASHTO standard, the American Association of State Traffic Highway Officials, which is the Federal Highway Administration one we're protesting, they say all the state officials have that. 
Therefore, it is reasonably available to the population that is affected. And our comment says, no, 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 no. Journalists, others, you know, we got people in North Dakota. Uh, and so we're attempting to, again, walk that through. They're going to issue a final regulation. We will then look at it and say, can we, can we litigate or not? But it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's a big deal litigation. These things are not cheap. You know, when, when you're, even if you got a pro bono law firm, I have nine pro bono law firms. Uh, working for us, uh, but they spend an awful lot of time and money on these things. So they, they got to be sure that it's a real fight that the, that is willing to you know get a dozen lawyers working really hard. And federal litigation is hard, it really is. But I, I am blessed because I have groups like Morrison and Forrester represent us in Germany. Um, we've got you know EFF and Fenwick and West and Dury Tangri, uh, Davis Wright Tremaine represented us on on an IRS uh, suit to compel the release of e-file versions of nonprofit tax exemptions. And we won in the district court. IRS is uh, potentially appealing. We're waiting to find out what happened. Uh, whether the IRS will appeal or not, uh, they got a five-week stipulation. I think what's happening is it's a holding action to give the Solicitor General more time to decide whether or not he wants to appeal, because it's up to the Solicitor General. Uh, the release of e-file information, so the, the way nonprofit tax returns work is half of nonprofits um, e-file, which is XML data, and what the IRS says, I've got 8 million nonprofit Form 990s on my, my site, and they're actually on the Internet Archive, and ProPublica's got a copy of them. But those are all 200 dot per inch bitmaps, right? They're, they're bad scans, no metadata. In fact, it's really bad. You get a DVD, you get 30 DVDs every month, and each one has 60,000 one-page TIFF images on it, and the last DVD has a DAT file that says, oh, those files are this return. Um, so I crunch those through, but so what they do with the e-file data, you're going to love this. Um, they take the XML data, they image it onto the form and convert it into 200 dot per inch TIFF file. And so we went to them and said, give us a whole database. I had meetings in the White House with deputy commissioners, and they're like, no, 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 we can't do it for a whole bunch of reasons, including the fact that their processing system is based on Windows XP with an Oracle application on top. Um, among other problems, but they just simply refused. And so what I did is I FOIA, um, sent nine FOIA requests in, and I said, I don't want the whole database, I want these nine specific returns that we know have been e-filed, and they turned me down, and then we appealed, and then we went into litigation and said, under the e-FOIA Act, you have to give us this, and the district court judge agreed with us. Um, that's only nine of them, right? That's not the whole silly database, um, but it establishes the principle. And so we're hopeful, but it's going to take another year to get that e-file database done, which is just so, nuts. But the six thousand dollars hasn't been spent yet. Uh, so uh, the the uh, this was kind of funny. So the IRS said there were there were three reasons they couldn't give us this data. One is they were so concerned about privacy problems. Now. In 2011, I found 600,000 social security numbers in the IRS data, and their position at the time was that they would not redact any social security numbers because that would be altering a federal document and that would be illegal. And so they just, they knew there were socials and they just kept on shipping them out to all the vendors, GuideStar, me, and the others. Um, after we found 100,000 socials on the IRS website, uh, 43 members of Congress sent a letter to the IRS saying, what the fuck? Um, and the IRS came back in and said, oh, well, it turns out we are allowed to redact the data, and they changed their rules. And they're sort of beginning to redact. Um, so that, that's, the privacy issue is, is one of the big problems. But they, and so that was one reason they wouldn't give it to us. The second was, well, oh, this guy only wants nine, but you know, if he wants nine, everyone's going to FOIA this stuff. And so we need $20 million in order to build a better, better system. And then, um, so what was the third reason? Oh, and the third reason was, well, it would take us $6,200 in order to give you these nine files because we care about privacy so much. And my lawyer looks at it and goes, they're telling us they care about privacy. But that was interesting because we went back to the judge and said, look, they said it would cost $6,200. We're just dickering on price. We'll pay it. So, and the judge said, you're right, $6,200. You know, give them the data. Um, and you know, presumably the prices will go down. And the judge was very nice. He said, look, I understand this may cause you a problem going forward, but the E-FOIA Act, you know, everyone's getting their budgets cut. And the E-FOIA Act isn't, you know, that's not my problem. Um, so the, the judge was like, 
just go ahead and do it. Um, and so we're now waiting to find out whether or not they'll appeal the decision. And then more importantly, whether the IRS will talk with me about ways they could put the entire database online. And right now they won't talk because we're in litigation. So. But they really didn't want to do that. So. Uh, Michelle. How did the US situation compared to other countries? I mean, is it, is it better elsewhere or is it worse? Or so the question is, is it better or worse when it comes to edicts of government? So in India, um, it's a different situation because there it's not a private nonprofit publishing the standard. It is the Indian government. And in, in the Indian constitution, there's a very fundamental set of rights, like our Bill of Rights. And if you violate those fundamental rights, you can go straight to the Supreme Court. One of those rights is the right to practice your profession. It's about caste, right? You can't tell somebody you can't be a plumber because you were born over there. Um, well, the Indian standards, it turns out, are all about practicing your profession safely, how to be a plumber, how to do textile, how to do irrigation. And so we submitted a formal affidavit. It was called Petition to the Honorable Ministry. When you address a, a ministry, you call them the Honorable Ministry. And we have affidavits in there from myself, from Sam Petroda, who is a cabinet minister and a chief technology officer of India under three prime ministers, um, Vince Cerf and a whole bunch of distinguished Indian professors and citizens and hackers. And so we sent that to the ministry. Um, they haven't answered. Uh, we've taken their building code and totally redone it. It looks beautiful. And I'm sending copies of that into many of the ministers. So the Indian government charges $220 for the India building code in India. Right? That's a lot of money for a book. And there was a meeting of the Disaster Preparedness Task Force of India. All these senior earthquake and, and building and you know, officials. And one of them raised his hand and said, gee, we all ought to have copies of the building code. And the bureau stood up and said, well, that'll be $220 for each of you and you need to sign a license agreement. Um, so I, I, I think we have a strong ground in India. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's you need a license according to them. Now you know I've had these 19,000 standards online. They won't sell me any updates at this point. They cut me off. Um, but I've got the vast majority of these online at this point. And so far, it doesn't look like there's going to be any litigation. And if there is, we've got an extremely strong legal position. In Europe, they've thought very hard about this idea that the standards are sort of voluntary. Um, and you need to move beyond German law where, you know, it's pretty, we got convicted at the district court level, copyright violation, and move it up to the constitutional level where it's about human rights and rule of law and these, and that, that's a little harder. It isn't like there are Supreme Court precedents already on the books like we have in the U.S. So. It seems like most of your actions are, the, are this litigation, but have you found it more productive to go through litigation or to go through legislative and kind of browbeating, you know, your uh, so sympathetic. Uh, most of my action is is not litigation. Most of my action is actually posting the documents. Um, the litigation came I mean, after that. Okay, but for legislation, we have proposed an edicts of government amendment to the U.S. Copyright Act. I had 150 distinguished law professors sign it. I testified before Congress. I had four members of Congress stand up and in no uncertain terms saying the next Copyright Act has got to have an edicts of government provision. And that includes Congressman Issa on one side of the aisle and Congresswoman Lofgren on the other side. Um, so we got a shot at, at getting this through legislation, I, and that would simply codify long-standing common law public policy into the Copyright Act. Um, that would be the ideal outcome. I don't want to do litigation. Um, I knew that was a possibility, uh, but that wasn't my goal. My goal was to actually put the standards online and get people to use them. Um, same with the IRS. I offered to put the e-file data online for them, and I said, if you don't like me, go find Ed Felton in Princeton, or you know, go find a university in Utah, which is they do this in Ogden, Utah. Um, but we're here to help you. And same thing with the courts. When I go see judges, it's like I'm not here just to harass you. Um, we really want to make the system better. Uh, you know, that really is the goal here. And litigation is very much the last resort. What's the best way to, to get it to the, the place where it's actually easy to query and use? 
Well, <coughs> so we're proposing an experiment in which we put an entire district online, but ultimately this is the court's job to do it, right? If I scrape an entire district, I'm gonna be several months out of date. Right, because I got to run a privacy audit on it. It's a lot of work. This is something the government ought to be doing. So that's really the goal is policy change. The, the goal for PACER is very simple. Drop the paywall. And if you drop the paywall, people will be able to scrape the data, put it online, work with it. There'll be a whole bunch of different versions. Um, but, you know, Bloomberg will have one version and Lexus will have another. But researchers in academia will have one and, and the system will get way better. Now, I'd like it if they redid PACER and added a few things like bulk data. Uh, but at the end of the day, if they drop the paywall, we can take it from there. You know? How much would it cost to do that? To actually buy all the PACER documents? Well, I'm just curious, yeah. Yeah, it's a billion documents. It's a, a whole bunch of money. Um, you know, I looked at that. I mean, that would be the easy solution. Just buy one of each and you're done with the discussion. Um, but it's, it's way more than we I mean, it's in uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know. Services taking up interest uh, or listen to your arguments. Um, uh, the other question is: Are there s states or municipalities that are leading the way and doing a good job of this? So 18F can't like walk into the IRS and say we're going to do this, right? They have to be invited in, and they haven't been invited in. Um, PACER is totally another branch of government. There's no way the courts are going to let the General Services Administration come in and run their database. That's just not going to happen, right? Um, as to whether cities are doing a better job, absolutely, positively, Chicago, Baltimore, New York City are all leading the way in this area. It's, it's a dramatic sea change. The city codes are, are getting up online in a clueful format. Nice UIs. I was there when Seamus Craft and the city of Chicago unveiled the new Chicago city code. Huge win. Huge win, and a win that everybody gets, right? Because a lot of people have to look at the city codes, and when it gets better, we found this with the Federal Register, when it went from really bad to like federalregister.gov is like amazingly better. Every single civil servant in Washington noticed that change and went, whoa, this is great. You know, you can do stuff like notifications for any Federal Register actions within my geographic area. I have searches for the words incorporation by reference. I get notified anytime that happens. Way better than it was. But the cities are clearly leading the way. Absolutely. I just want to give a shout out to Ohio. Because not a lot of people know this the state, but Ohio, being a very, you know, maybe red state, is leading the way in a lot of open data stuff, which uh, their entire... Uh, OLIS, which is their uh, legal publication system, everything's online. The, in fact, the way they disseminate documentation that I talk to them about is to put it online first. So as the le legislation gets, you know, as the gavel comes down, it hits that system within minutes. Well, I didn't know that. That's a sea change because Ohio used to really like, you know, hey, like, look at you know, OLIS and yeah. see, cool. me, I, I definitely want to yeah. hear your opinion on, on what so there's doing. no fees at all? Zero fees, but I can tell you though, here, here's the interesting thing. They've got no safeguards on whether I hack the system. And so I could go in and change the legislation without them knowing it. So if you go to the publisher in one form, if you published online in another, and there's no safeguard against that. Which I well, you, that you need to send them a certified letter and point that out. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of did that. Oh, seriously? Yeah. No, I, and I kind of, I seriously yeah. did that. Okay, good, good. Uh, things are changing. They really are. I mean, it's way better than it was when I started doing this, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Um, much easier. A lot more people get it. We still don't have a president that gets it, right? Um, he's not technically very astute. I know his chief of staff. He's not technically very astute. Um, it needs that top level kind of buy-in. And we're starting to get that, you know, if you look here in New York, you got a member of the city council who really lives and breathes this stuff. The big issue is whether that's going to turn from ideas into actual production systems. And that's the challenge that the cities face right now. Right? It's, it's good to do the hackathons, it's good to do the concepts, um, but at the end of the day, this stuff is production. It's real, real world, people need to use it, and it needs to go in at scale. And when it does, citizens notice. They love, you know, remember when Adrian Holovati did the crime maps in Chicago? Everybody noticed, oh my gosh, I can figure out if there's crime in my area. This is bread and butter politics. Huge win if you do this stuff at the city level. Michelle. Um, yeah, I, I would like to know um, back to the federal level and the mm -hmm. government level whether uh, the tragic story of Aaron has changed anything. I mean, is it uh, no. before and after or not? Qu 
question is, did, did Aaron's uh, death change things at the federal level? No, uh, there are people that were shocked and dismayed, uh, but it, it did not change CFAA prosecutions. It did not change a, uh, I mean, there are people like Elizabeth Warren who get it. And, and Elizabeth Warren used PACER a lot because she was a bankruptcy specialist, right? So she went into PACER constantly. Um, but as a general rule, it's, it's operating at a much higher level. Um, this comes down to big information technology systems, big boats that you're trying to change around, billion dollar procurements in many cases. Um, and so it's, it's a different level of a fight. Do I want to be public printer of the United States? You know, right now, I don't know. For, for one thing, the, the staff at the, the government printing office keeps going down and down and down and down and down. Um, I don't know, you know, if the president wants to nominate me for that and I can make it through a Senate confirmation and it's public service, and then you do it. Um, unlikely to happen. Uh, probably wouldn't happen under a Hillary Clinton administration, although you never know. You know, I worked for John Podesta for, for quite a while. I know him pretty well. Um, he has some respect for my work, but whether or not, a lot of people in government think I'm more valuable outside of government. And so it's not like I've been offered jobs in the White House or anything. Can you uh, explain the role of the public printer? Yeah, the public printer of the United States is responsible for, among other things, publishing the official journals of government. So the Congressional Record, Code of Federal Regulations, Federal Register. It is also a printing publication shop for other agencies, although increasingly the agencies do their own work. Uh, but the, the big, the crown jewel is that. The other reason I like the government printing office is they got a huge headquarters downtown. They used to get 20 trainloads of paper being piped in every day. And so they've got these huge concrete floors and big elevators, and a lot of that space isn't being used because they keep downsizing and downsizing or using less printing. And I thought to myself, you know, the OC48 lines you could pull out of that fiber that runs around the Capitol, you could put a machine room downtown, and one of the big problems in the DC area is finding colo space. And so you could do that. You could begin training some of the GPO staff on how to be operators and, and you know, work these machine rooms. So you got a, a path for stopping to fire these people that are actually good public servants and very skilled printers, and they could learn this. And so to me, that was very attractive. Right now, the government pays a whole bunch of money for transit on the internet. And my idea was that you run an OC48 line around the Capitol, or OC192, or, or you know, even faster. And then you run that out to the, to the peering points and you go to all the big networks like Verizon and the others and say, you know, we will happily exchange data with you, but we're not going to pay you for transit. We want to peer with you as a level one network. You, you have an internet exchange right in Ashburn. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. There, there's actually three out there. Um, it would not be hard to run fiber out. And the fiber is already there. When I, I talked to Vivek Kundra, uh, who was our first CIO, but before that he was in DC. And so he knew where all the fiber was in the district. And he was like, yeah, that would be easy to do. So, I, you know, that, that was to me an attractive potential position. Um, the downside of the government printing office is actually part of the legislative branch. So that means it can work with the courts, for example, they publish PACER opinions, uh, but they got to be pretty conservative because they report to the, you know, the printing committee and, and so whether or not you could actually get all that stuff done, um, you know, I don't know. But it seemed worth a shot when the president came in, so. Minor thing, but the government printing office just created an organization on GitHub. Yeah. I don't know if that means anything. Yeah, it's symbolic right now, but I mean, all the government agencies are doing GitHub now. Um, whether that's actual real code. Um, you had a question, didn't you? Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you. Um, I'm a community builder by trade, and I'm mm -hmm. curious what you think the biggest challenge is to getting broad support, because it seems pretty obvious to anybody who is on our end and kind of gets it. How, how have you, what is the biggest challenge that you think that you faced? trying to get people outside of our community. Like on the Pacer campaign, for example? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's something I've thought about a lot because that's the easy answer when you think about it. Everybody stands up and, you know, change happens. Um, so Can I tried Law.com. Can we do screenings of the movie of, like, Aaron's The Internet's Own Boy? Because I think You can do, do postcards um, and send them in. Yeah. Like, no, New York, I'd love it if New York did something, if you had a Pacer polling place but, and but, show the movie, get people to fill out postcards. Do it nationally. Like, my, yeah. my role is to work with people 
community builders, so they know everyone. Like that's their I, job. Like, I'd love to do that with you. I, I'm trying to do that, and my, one of my hopes in doing the speaking tour is that there'll be a Pacer polling place in D.C., that there'll be one in New York, um, that we can maybe do this cards and letters thing, raise awareness, maybe do it again in a year, right? Maybe there'll be more people then. Uh, but one of the things I'm trying to figure out is whether people really want to do that. I mean, it's, it's easy to, and, and you know, if, if you guys want to do a pacer polling place for New York, that would be absolutely wonderful. One of the things I'm testing is whether or not people actually fill out these postcards. Right? Yeah, so, I come in, I talk for 45 minutes. If, uh, you know, when I was at MIT, I got, you know, half a dozen. So who has their postcard? <laughs> All right, I'm going to come by and collect them. Yeah. Just to make sure you don't walk out of here. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Why, why Judge uh, because she's a, the chief judge of, of, um, uh, of the uh, Southern District of New York, I think is the right one, right? Okay. Okay. Judge Preska, 500 Pearl Street. P-R-E-S-K-A. So the judge I clerked for, uh, I printed all his email out for him. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, so here's what I'm hoping. <laughs> so these judges are going to be like, what? Right, we're getting postcards with Judge Cardozo. What I'm hoping is that the next time they get together at the judicial conference, they go, you know, I got a bunch of these weird postcards. I got some too. I got some too. Judges don't like to be criticized. They don't like catching crap because the administrative office, uh, the judges don't get a cut of the PACER revenues. Um, and when I went and talked to a judge in the Ninth Circuit, he says, you know, we have no skin in the game in this one. And they don't like being criticized. They don't like letters coming in from senators and congressmen saying they're breaking the law. And so that's the hope, is that enough judges, even the, the printed email types, look at this and go, hmm, maybe I ought to look into it. Maybe yeah, it'll work, maybe it won't. I think I would just suggest, having been in chambers, it's, it's such a, a like, model of this is your cult of personality in every individual chamber. Of course. Right? So of course. getting that intelligence is key. Yeah. Right? Like this would this will not get to would not get to my judge. Uh, and I'm not, and I'm no, not, I get I'm that. not saying don't send it to Prescott. I get that. You know it's it's not like uh, See, here's, what here's what I hope. Here's what I hope is when Prescott goes to the next judicial conference meeting and let's say Judge Thomas in the Ninth Circuit or you know one of the other judges says, I got all these strange postcards, Judge Prescott will go, I got some of those too. Yeah, yeah. What is their problem? What, what, what do they care about? And, and maybe one of the judges will say, well, you know, here's what they care about. Um, particularly now that we have this big Ninth Circuit, you know, if you go to law.resource.org slash PACER, you'll see all my PACER filings and the Ninth Circuit thing. Um, and we're hoping that at some point somebody will say, you know, we got to do something, right? We can't just sit back and do nothing like we have since 2008. We, we got to consider at least some moves to do something. Particularly if members of Congress start writing them letters saying, what about this privacy problem? What about these billing errors? You know? When you say that, when you say um, there's no skin in the game for them, how does the money get allocated to the white screen team? Oh, it goes to the uh, administrative office of the courts, and the administrative office of the courts decides, you know, where, where they're going to spend their money, and that might mean they ship a TV to the IT dude in, in you know, a particular district court. So, you got a question? Yeah, those are all good ideas. So the, the question is, is two things. One is, can we raise general awareness? And yes, absolutely, that's important. Uh, the second question is, can we actually get people to do something specific on, you know, in a two to three week time frame? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it's going to take more people like you, yourselves saying, gee, this is an important campaign. I'm going to, you know, we're going to set up something on May 1, or we're going to send mail to our friends in another city and suggest they do it. Um, and I, I think that's really the key. Um, I really think there's a lot of people that care about access to justice um, and that if they understand this is an important issue, maybe they'll do something. You know? And it doesn't have to be these postcards, by the way. It can it just be a letter, right? Or send flowers to the judge, whatever. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think there, and, and it may take a few years to do this properly. Um, but at some point, if enough people are standing up, members of Congress will certainly pay attention to that. And I think the judges may pay attention to that. Yeah. 
Well, uh, what you do is you install the Recap plugin, uh, which works on Firefox and Chrome. And the way that works is when you download a document, you get the document. It also goes to the Internet Archive. And the next person who goes in sees a little R next to the document. And that's your signal that the thing is already up on the Internet Archive. So you, you install the, the plugin. But again, I, I'm not convinced there's going to be a huge outpouring of people downloading 15 bucks worth. But you know, you might, you may be surprised. You just never know. I, I've learned to, you know, just basically sit back and watch on some of these things. You try as as much as you can, but you just never know what's going to work. You know, and that's why it's important to try a whole bunch of different things. A lot of my focus has been a on these postcards and on this fee exemption, the billing errors. I, I'm trying to get enough scandals into the into the works that people think they got a problem. More questions? One more. Did you see uh, John Oliver interview Edward Snowden? And I no, I didn't. To see what you're, okay. No, I didn't. But I, I love John Oliver. Um, mm -hmm. he, yeah. he used, he was trying to translate technology and getting people to care about the topic, yeah. and he used dick pics as the, the reference because yeah. everybody gets Yeah, yeah. John Oliver famous. would totally get this issue, and you know, I, I always thought that John Stewart would get the issue, and it's just a matter of, you know, can you, yeah. can you get to them? Um, <laughs> obviously, John Stewart is not going to be a... Uh, a place to appear in the future. So, <laughs> we done? Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Let's give let's give Carl a round of applause. Uh, also, big shout out to the Internet Society of New York and Jolly McPhee for live streaming, videotaping this, and then processing it and putting it up to the Beta NYC YouTube page. So let's give him a round yeah. of applause. Remember, I want those postcards back. Uh, I have a, I have grabbed a majority of them, okay. so for if those of you... If you don't fill them out, I'm going to bring them to the next stop and then bring them back to the internet. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy to send you some if you end up doing a piece of poll. And, and so that I will get to. Uh, can you yeah. describe just briefly the books that you brought um, that we have? Yeah, I, I brought you a copy of yo.yourhonor.org. It's a printed version of it. Uh, so it's, it's all online. Uh, I brought a couple other pamphlets, all that stuff's online. I brought you 10 Rules for Radicals, which is a... Uh, keynote talk I did at the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, uh, one called uh, Crime and Access to Knowledge, which was my essay about Aaron and what he was doing and, and, and what I thought of that. So uh, take one for yourself, and if there's a few extra, take one for your coworkers, please. Uh, I think it's really important to hear what Carl is saying and share it, because it's a little complicated. Uh, you know, it's very nuanced. Um, it's something that you kind of want to have a dinner dinner conversation over, but it's really, really important stuff because it is the core operating system of our democracy. Um, and so uh, thanks for coming out this evening. Thanks for being part of this uh, intimate affair that we had here at New York City. Um, so please take those uh, pamphlets that Carl generously mailed out. Uh, please return the postcards that he generously brought and that he's included in his campaign. Um, I think that uh, looking at May 1, uh, it's a Friday. Uh, for those of you who are into GIS data, uh, it's Gizmo's 25th anniversary. Gizmo is an organization here in the city uh, that's been fighting for GIS data. They actually have a, a they're celebrating their 25th birthday. Uh, I think that there's an opportunity since it's on a Friday, we could probably do a closing party uh, and do a May Day party. I'm mean, sorry, a Law Day party. Uh, is my ahead. red shirt exposed? Oh, no. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, I think maybe you may see something. If you're interested in organizing one of those days, these events take uh, people who are passionate to kind of carry it through. Uh, we have a number of volunteers here at Beta NYC who are organizing events. Uh, we'd love to see more. Uh, so on talk.beta.nyc, we'll post a thread. Uh, I'll send a message to the meetup, seeing if there's interest in hosting a, um, a, a law day party. I know Aaron meant a lot to me. Uh, I supported his documentary, um, and it'd be good to, um, to honor him in that way. So uh, thanks again for coming out this evening. Um, we are not having any other events at New York City for the uh, short term, or for the near term, I should say. We're moving most of our events to uh, Civic Hall, which is uh, in the Flatiron District. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to Civic Hall, you'll really enjoy the space. Uh, it's a, a very posh, uh, polished uh, co-working location. Um, we've been able to negotiate where we'll have three conference rooms um, and, and a space for about 20 people outside of that. 
to be working on different projects. Um, so legal hackers, come bring your, your legal hack projects. Um, we are gonna start meeting there every Wednesday. We're gonna continue our relationship with Queens, the Coalition for Queens, and we're exploring if, uh, to start back up our Brooklyn night, potentially with GovLab. Uh, we're trying to finalize those dates. Uh, so uh, thank you, New York City, for hosting us uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, we'll see you at Civic Hall, and we'll see you at Coalition for Queens. Um, huh? What? No? Okay. Um, so uh, just a few closing things. Uh, if you could take the chairs, there are two rolly bins over there to stack them. It would be really, really helpful uh, to help us stack these chairs. Uh, Vulcan, can, uh, Vulcan and Terrence, who are here, can help guide and make sure that those chairs are stacked. We have a bunch of beer and cider uh, left over. Uh, for those of you who are interested in uh, taking that home, beer and cider. Uh, we also have soda and two liters. Uh, whatever isn't taken by you uh, is going to be left here for the New York City uh, people. Um, so uh, it's going to be a gracious donation to New York City and to uh, hopefully you, your belly, and your roommates, uh, maybe your coworkers. So uh, thanks again for coming out this evening. Uh, Really appreciate uh, the two nights, the, if you attend both nights. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you on Monday at Civic Hall uh, for our next event, um, the Civic Tech Ignite. So uh, thanks again. Thanks, Carl. Let's give Carl another round of applause.